born in southern Illinois. I lived a short stint in Chicago, moved to Memphis, Tennessee, spent my um, elementary and middle school there. Then I moved to Dallas, Texas, and then I landed in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And then in LA, I made a decision to stay. I was tired of moving all the time, so I went to the University of Southern California for my undergrad studied with Ruth Weisberg and Philip Melnick and fell in love with photography by seeing a video of Dorothea Lange with John Sarkowski talking about her work before her retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art. Her vibrancy, the way she talked, how she carried herself, what was important about photography. I could see she became an inspiration because she was connected with the negatives and the prints as she talked to Sarkowski about them. And I said right there and then in 1971, I'm going to take photography seriously and I'm going to become a photographer. And I might add, I did not know how to draw. Well, I was in Los Angeles uh, at the University of Southern California and chose photography in the, in the late 60s, I was influenced by a lot of journalism that you would see coming through. I mean, it was uh, quite a time with protesting against the Vietnam War and so many of the social issues. And then, of course, the gentleman I studied with, Philip Melnick, I got the standard 70s education of black and white street photography and became very enamored with that. And then right near graduation, he showed me some alternative processes. And I also fell very much in love with working in the dark room, cyanotyping or blue printing, uh, brown printing, gum printing. I took a year off and worked for the 3M Color and Color Corporation as a color consultant. And then that was the job that helped me return to schooling in 74. Um, and I went to the California State University Fullerton and my mentors were Daryl Curran and Eileen Cowan. Yes, my undergrad at University of Southern California was formal and all the formalism from printmaking, painting, and photography. When I enrolled at Cal State Fullerton, I was shown um, alternate ways to make images using the lens, lens-based, and also cameraless. Um, I would call it a process training and my creative process was about coming up with an idea and then marrying it with a process. And so um, that became the challenges in my undergrad and graduate, but now I had this uh, like a kitchen full of ingredients where I could uh, go into color, I could think about other ways of making images, other surfaces like fabric. And so I became very enamored with what if, what if I try this, what if I try that. And so, um, and I was also involved very much in the Los Angeles uh, photographic community, the Los Angeles Center for Photographic Studies, which I eventually became the president of for a while. I think it's because they knew I could do the work more than anything, but uh, we were trying to get photography recognized as a fine art. Uh, the L.A. community in the 70s was really a thriving community. Again, trying to get museums and other institutions to recognize photography as a fine art. And LACPS was one organization I was really involved with. Another one was Los Angeles Camera Work, which was in Southern California. And it was spearheaded by people like Robert Heineken, Daryl Curran. We had uh, gallery starting to open. G. Ray Hawkins was one that was showing traditional photography uh, like Ansel Adams. I was there at the uh, announcement that Ansel was no longer going to print anymore, buy now, uh, or you're, the price is right. And so it was just very, very exciting time. A lot of grassroots shows, a lot of choices and influences and Heineken also brought in a lot of people to share a second seat 
uh, at UCLA for teaching. Judith Golden came in, Todd Walker came in, uh, William Larson from Tyler came in. So it was just a uh, cornucopia or a garden full of seeds being planted for all of us to uh, absorb and thrive. So it was a very exciting time. Unfortunately, there were not a lot of full-time teaching jobs after graduate school. So I went and worked for a while for a department store in their advertising, learned a, a lot of you know, skill sets that you don't learn in college, and uh, then got part-time work. And then in 1980, I was hired full-time at Grossmont College in San Diego. So although I did not want to move anymore, I'd moved so much, I made the big move all by myself to San Diego, knowing only the two people that hired me. And that too was an adventure. Mm. I had to take my students to Los Angeles to see works on the wall, which I believe is a very important educational component of teaching the medium. And so when I heard MOPA was opening in uh, 1983, or got the word in 82, I was ecstatic because now we wouldn't have to drive up the five and spend all day seeking out original prints and original works. And so I stepped up and volunteered and asked how can I help because it was a huge component in my instructional curriculum to have a museum to come and see original works. So one of the things that I volunteered for 40 years ago when MOPA op was going to open their doors before they built their final walls, the drywall was available to have what we called a pushpin picture party. You could show your work in the new Museum of Photographic Arts, bring it, we'll supply the pushpins, and then you can sign your name on the wall, which will go into the future, your name, just, you know, just like maybe a tomb in Egypt or whatever, you are now immortalized with your Sharpie signature on the bare walls of the museum. It was a great idea for opening uh, the space up before it was uh, finished. It was also a chance to see the enthusiasm of the community for a photographic museum. And of course, it was a chance to get a mailing list because before you could pin, you had to sign up to let us know uh, what your interests were in the photographic medium. It was a two or three day festival. We had Roger Hedgecock, one of the, uh, the, well, the mayor of San Diego at the time, come with a film crew and pin his 8x10 glossy up. And we had all kinds of little kids pinning down at the bottom and people finding space up at the top. We were running out for push pins. Uh, I think we wiped the whole city of push pins. It was a very, very exciting event. Then it was constructed and remodeled, and we had a gala um, to celebrate it. And uh, we got director's chairs with our names on them, and we were launched with the first exhibition. And it was exciting. It was very, very exciting. Well, one of my discoveries when I arrived in San Diego, besides uh, easier commuting and lots of sunshine and perpetually 72 in paradise, I decided I needed a sport, and in Los Angeles your sport was sort of the studio going to openings and teaching because of the uh, amount of travel required. So again, in 20 minutes you could be at the beach, and I found ocean swimming after returning to pool swimming for a while to, to kind of strategize how to improve my stroke. I was a big swimmer as a little kid. I was the one who had to get out for wrinkled fingers. So to be underwater in another reality, which is what my first experience at the La Jolla Cove was, was seeing the Garibaldis, of seeing the ebb and flow of the seaweed and the orange Garibaldis and the seals and swimming out to the first buoy, turning back, especially near sunset and seeing the La Valencia lit up like a cathedral with the skimming, uh, what do they call that, that golden hour sunlight. That became a, a parallel thread or passion in my life and in, in my work. And I brought that to the studio 
So I don't know what that says because water is uncontrollable, yet I put it in a tank and I want to control it. So there's a little, uh, you know, dichotomy there in, in the choice of working styles. Okay. When you consider my journey to San Diego and then my living here for 43 more or more years, you have to look at the common threads that run through my involvement with the community, with education, and my personal life. And the threads intertwine, and they can't help but overlap. So when I say the water holds me, it's like uh, this place holds me. Uh, this is my home. I no longer have to move every three years because my father gets a better opportunity in a corporate America. I get to put my roots down, and I get to be part of something that informs me and I can inform them. So um, when I say the water holds me, yes, it's about the ocean. It's about the fluidness of the water, about uh, the serendipity of the water. Um, but it's also about life's path. And as an educator, I've hopefully inspired people to fall in love with photography and be impassioned about it as I am. But MOPA has been here for me to provide for that uh, infusion of information and ideas and visiting artists and workshops. And I don't have to go anywhere. It's all brought to me and brought to um, my classroom. Um, my personal life, I married. I have a daughter who has recently turned 30. And the reason that I'm an activist now with the water that still holds me is that I went, uh, entered a competition in 2015 after my full retirement from teaching and came out with oil and particles and debris all over me. And I go, this is not the ocean I remember. What's wrong with my ocean? And so that was the trigger to start looking at what was happening to cl the climate, the climate change. And San Diego is a water-based community. We are a harbor. We have the Navy. We are about the water. So to make sure that it's there for my daughter and maybe her children, I had to make a statement. So I went into mythology, which is where my early aqueous myths seem to reside now, 40 years later. And I looked for a mythological pattern or history or other women of power that I could showcase and I found the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades. I have a prequel to the Aqueous Myths and that is that I was invited to use the Polaroid 2024 camera in 1983 in the gallery in MOPA and I was called in to do it and I thought what am I going to do and the only thing I knew was swimming and there's a a Greek saying, get close to what you know, and that's what I knew best. So I had a tank built, four feet by six feet by 18 inches deep, filled it with water in, a, in, the, in the museum, brand new parquet floors, and I'm pouring water there. Rolled a, a Polaroid 2024 up to the water at the, in the tank, and I just described swimming because that's what I knew at the time. I did close the set for an afternoon and did some figurative work, but basically I had found what I was going to do next thanks to this opportunity. The opportunity that I was provided for was very unique in that the Polaroid 20 by 24 camera makes a 20 inch by 24 inch instant Polaroid. It's a, a large uh, bellows camera with a lens and then of course the receptor is the Polaroid materials. It comes with an operator, John Reuter, and um, it's instant. You don't get to look through the viewfinder. You get to look at the ground glass, but the moment of exposure, you stand by the side of the camera and anticipate the motion or the action, in my case, with the water. Um, there's no mirror in it, so we had to put a mirror over the lens so that the image reflected up into the mirror and then was fed back to be received by the Polaroid matrix. 
So it was 60 opportunities to push the button and to see what happens. And I, I took full opportunity to do that. I was the lead off for it. So it was very, very exciting. And um, each time you pulled it, a minute or so, or I think it was two and a half minutes later, you would see what you captured. So you were always making decisions on the fly when you were setting up your shots and working with it. Um, I had people on the side coming in and making waves, trying to create a depth in the water and a current because water is so uh, fluid and it hides a lot of sins. So it was very, very exciting. So I had a group of wave makers and we had a very exciting two-day uh, session with the camera. And then what was next? Take that tank home and get the 4x5 view camera out with film and continue the process of photographing women in water, which represents the struggle hidden in the aqueous myths. And so the aqueous myths were uh, born in my studio and they were women in water struggling because I was struggling. That thread of my lifetime was struggling. Struggling so, uh, not in any real deep way, but um, I had a lot of hurdles moving down here that were typical of being the first woman hired to teach photography in San Diego County. So there were lots of questions about my qualifications and my ability to do the job and the process school that I came from. Why was alternative process is so important? And what did Heineken have to do with anything in the making of work or a mindset? So I was constantly being queried about, um, well, what do you think photography looks like for the future and, and ideas like that? And so I would go home and I would go, hey, why aren't they just giving me a chance to do my job and uh, do the best I can and infuse the community with alternatives? So out of that struggle of convincing people, and at some point I gave up, uh, I just did my job, but the struggles uh, I held tight to my heart. And so I could get rid of those struggles by swimming. So when I say the water holds me, it's soothing, it's solace. It's also a challenge. You have to pull yourself through. It's not like walking through air. You have to move an element, both uh, as one of our earth element skies, but you also have to move it physically and virtually. So struggle is a common thread between the aqueous myths and the seven sisters. And now the struggle is about climate change and about the sea can't wash away all the evil anymore. We have to start taking care of our ocean. In both of the struggles, it's presenting, I hope, to the viewer, at least I believe they are, powerful women trying to make a difference. So as you enter the exhibition, you will be greeted by the powerful women in the Aqueous Myths series who became named later after I made them with the names of goddesses from all cultures, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, indigenous, Eskimo, so forth. Um, you will see them uh, confronting you. You will see them challenging you. And then as you move farther in, there is an installation at the end of the gallery of the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades. And the Seven Sisters are actually, the Pleiades are a constellation in the sky. They were put up there by Zeus so that men could not acquire them. They were born of the water. Their mother was Pleione, which was a nymph, water nymph. And so their home is being destroy, destroyed by humanity. So they come down from the stars, all but one, who is still going across the sky. They hide themselves under the giant Pacific garbage patch because that's where we need the most saving of the grace of our planet. Um, and in my storyline that I make up as I make each one of the seven sisters in my tank, um, they, I make costumes from recyclable things that might be in the gyra or the garbage patch. 
And then I attack the seven things that we should be the most worried about. And one is single-use single plastics, our water bottles. Uh, another one is as the plastic breaks down, the particles, we need to be concerned about them because fish and other animals are eating them and they are now be coming onto our dinner table if you're eating fish. Um, the jellyfish look like or plastic bags look like to the turtle. He doesn't know the difference. Jellyfish and so these one-use plastic bags are harmful. We, with sunscreen and tourism and the heated waters, we're ruining the coral reefs. Um, ghost nets fall off the boats as well as fishermen throw them over because, again, they believe the sea can absorb so much of our trash. But it is not our sewer. Um, it needs to be coveted and cleaned and preserved for future generations. So. Um, how do you get rid of those little microparticles became a question near the end of my series. So I have one of them twirling and creating an eddy that sends the microparticles up to that seventh sister who takes them and with her goddess-like strength molds them into stars and then throws them into the heavens. When the water holds your entire body in suspension and you're floating, I believe, in a feminine element, you, um, you have sensations of touch and cold and the laps and it's, a, it's just a v very great place to renew your day, to calm your beating heart, all kinds of things. So in my work I wanted the women to be as close to life size as possible in the water so you feel an invitation like I do when I go swimming. So I wanted some transference that you would stand there and feel the same, close to the same. It's about two-thirds, three-quarters scale to a human body. But I'm inviting you in with the scale of the work. The lighting, the, the waves, all of that are supposed to, again, fill the, the soul of the person in the image, but are also supposed to be visual elements. So I view the water as a visual element as much as uh, an element of our earth and sky and fire and air and all the other elements that are out there. One of the challenges moving forward as an artist, which Photoshop seems to have so beautifully helped me, is that I wanted larger bodies of water. And in the earlier aqueous myths, I started doing triptychs and working on creating bigger scales with single frames juxtaposed together. Um, I took one of the last pieces I made because it needed to be redone and through Photoshop I made a big body of water circa 2023. So there's a lovely craft or visual transition between 83 where it all has to be on the film and 2023 where you have the power of the pixel to make the kind of images that you want. So when you view the seven sisters, I was allowed to make water above them and below them. I was able to add waves and other elements through um, purchasing files at Shutterstock and other companies that, uh, that will sell you um, uh, non-copyrighted images. So I was able to make it big water and big ocean and big sky and coming down from the stars and also to heighten the amount of debris and things in the water that are harming our ocean. And they're hanging as scrolls in the back of the gallery and we create a sort of a half circle so you kind of walk in and you can confer with the women. You can turn in a circle and see them joining together the power of sending the particles to the stars. And so it's another invitation through scale to invite you in and to experience that the water holds us. Well, when I swim, um, I, I think about things. I, I uh, let go of the things that I left on shore, like meetings, teaching, institutions, uh, mom, I need you. 
and I swim and my mind becomes very active and I you know silently talk to myself as I put my head down and swim either laps or swim out to the buoy so this idea of sharing my voice with the observers of my work to further invite them in that the water holds me I wanted to share my experience in, a, in another sensory way, audio, let them hear some of the thoughts I might have. Strangely enough, just like an athlete, I have a ritual where I, at the pool, I sit on the edge and I, I flutter my feet back and forth and I wait for the water to invite me in. The same with the ocean. I stand and it's colder, so I've got to work at it a little harder to go into the cold water. But it feels good once I get fully immersed and start swimming in a rapid way to warm up. So my voice, uh, or rather the audio that you're going to hear from my voice, although it's uh, someone speaking, is that invitation to come in, to feel what I feel, both in scale by the figures and also by the words that I want to share with you. One of the things that I learned from uh, Robert Heineken in a short workshop I took with him, and it's what printmakers do, is that um, when you're making a plate in printmaking, you start on it, and then while it's eating in the acid, you start another plate, and then you start another plate, and you have projects going on all the time. So I always have something that interests me over here and then I have something that I kind of have my sights on over here. So um, a side project is that I want to do images of black water because I believe that the sea is becoming a saturated solution. So I guess it's sort of harboring my dark side. But those will be small prints maybe in a little portfolio or a book, I don't know, with writing. I'm getting really interested in writing. But part two of the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades is that we will suffer a apocalypse. And the really smart people will go back to the ocean to survive. And they will go underwater. And the Seven Sisters will come back with other gods and goddesses to help them. And we will help repopulate the earth by using the octopus as like a baby monitor. And we will have the dolphins help with nursing. And we will also help the creatures that have ingested the plastic become purified. And my dream, and I'm holding myself to it now by going public, is one big wall, kind of like you go in a natural history museum and you walk in and you see like man stand up and walk out. I want to do the dystopia and apocalypse and then the rebirthing and then all of a sudden our children find it safe to go back on land. Because I really believe that Mother Nature right now is trying to shake off some of the bad stuff that has happened to our planet. And those of us who want to go forward will need to find a better way to save grace.